Bonjour everyone, I'm Ariel with Urbanist and today we're going to walk along the Champs-Elysees at night to enjoy the City of Lights, Paris, France. Right now we're looking at the Eiffel Tower lit up at night. However, I would like to put a disclaimer. This video is purely for personal reasons. If you ever seen my Eiffel Tower broadcast before, you will know why I said that. And here is the Champs d'Elysée. Oh, the beautiful song by Joe Dessine, one of my favorite songs about Paris. Right here, the Grand Boulevard, that is famous all around the world. And we are on top of the Arc de Triomphe. Hello, Kay. Hello, George. So welcome everyone. I just ran up the steps after grabbing a very beautiful dinner along the Champs d'Elysees. I'm gonna point out the place I went to. However, like in Paris, you do as the Parisians do. You sit for two hours to have some dinner. And that's why I'm a little bit delayed. However, I did my best to go up the steps, which was a whole lot. And I'm here on top of the Arc de Triomphe. Today we're going to learn about the history of the Arc de Triomphe and then we're going to walk along the Champs-Élysées, learn a little bit about the history of this iconic boulevard, point out all the beautiful shops and a few of the restaurants. <sighs> okay, so let's go. Let me show you the beautiful views uh, before the Arc de Triomphe closes at 10 p.m. Bonsoir, Alda. Bonsoir, everyone. Chantel, bonsoir. Welcome. Hello, Sherry. You'll be here Friday. Amazing. So this is the Champs-Élysées, one of the most iconic boulevards in all the entire world. It's named after the Elysian Fields because the Elysian Fields were the, in Greek mythology, the place where national heroes lay to rest. And this boulevard was built in honor of all those national heroes. First, the national heroes of the royalty, and then the national heroes of the French Revolution. Right down there is the Musel de Louvre. We see the Ferris wheel. And here we get to see the grand boulevards that Georges Eugène Haussmann built all along Paris. The Arc de Triomphe being the centerpiece of that grand city plan. Right there is the Eiffel Tower lit up at night with its skylight, with the spotlight shining through. However, I must put a disclaimer, this video is purely for personal reasons. Purely personal reasons. Uh, this, this video is not making any money whatsoever. If you've seen my Eiffel Tower broadcast, you'll know why I'm saying that. Just let the world know. Personal reasons. I'm taking a tourist video. I'm just... I happen to be up on Urbanist. Just by pure chance. Alright? I hope all of you agree with me, right? Just say in the comments that, yeah, this is a personal video. So let's walk around. And see more of the views. It's packed with people. You see how many people are here? Amari, this sounds uh, stupid, but you had no idea how much the Eiffel Tower stood out in the skyline. Yeah, I mean, the Eiffel Tower is among the tallest tower in historic Paris. Very personal video. 100% personal. This is, I just uh, posted this to show to my family. I don't know why all of you are here, but um, yes. George, uh, watch my Eiffel Tower broadcast. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat it here, <laughs> but watch my Eiffel Tower broadcast. You'll see why. Oh, look at this. Wow. So there we see in the distance La Défense, which I'll visit later next week, uh, probably on Friday or Thursday. Stay tuned for that. 
but George Eugen Hausman built, completely destroyed medieval Paris and rebuilt Paris from the ground up back in 1854. It took many years to do that. Displaced hundreds of thousands of people, especially the lower and middle classes. And he ended up building all these beautiful buildings in the uniform style, all with mansard roofs, pretty much in uniform heights. The heights vary just a little bit, but almost uniform heights. And that's why Paris has this unique beauty, because it almost feels like a curated painting or a, or a, or a sculpture that someone designed very purposefully. Uh, George, you do you have to rewatch it because I explicitly said why. <laughs> you'll you'll see. <laughs> All right, hello everyone, welcome. So, what are we on top of? We are on top of the Arc de Triomphe. Arc de Triomphe was uh, built in the 1850s. It finished construction in the 1850s. It started constructing around 1802 under the guise of Napoleon the first or Napoleon Bonaparte. As we know, Napoleon Bonaparte really loved building monuments to himself. This was built after he won the Battle of Austerlitz. However, we'll continue that story as we go downstairs uh, and we see the Arc de Triomphe from outside. But as we look at the beautiful skyline that is surrounding us right now, we have to take a moment to breathe it in, but also to be thankful, be grateful that this is still standing. Because we were this close <laughs> till Paris could have been burned to the ground. For that, we have to go back to June 1940. Paris was lit up, but not so much. Most of the places were gone dark, especially at night. There was a blackout, curfew hour. No buildings were allowed to shine at night, not even the Eiffel Tower, nor the Arc de Triomphe. But why? A nearby village was actually lit up brightly at night. They even set up in the same layout as Paris. However, that's strange. Why light up an unknown village on the outskirts of Paris, but not light up Paris itself? Well, it's because in 1939 to 1940, France was at war. All of Europe was immersed into a war. A war against the Germans who were attacking quickly, nation after nation. First Poland, then Austria, then Belgium. Finally, in June 9th, 1940, the Germans arrived here. Even though it was blacked out, there was no resistance. Why? Because the French declared this a, a free city. They did not want the city to be destroyed at all. And the Germans complied. They complied for various reasons. One reason is that they actually enjoyed the city. It was very popular amongst the German people. Also, many tourists wanted to come here, and the Germans were ready to take the city intact in order to make it a tourist destination. Two, it was a very important strategic place, so they didn't want to destroy it to the ground. They wanted to use it for its military importance. So they rolled right in, right along the Champs-Élysées, through the Arc de Triomphe, marching down with their swastika laden So the Germans were here for four years. As they were here, they started changing the signs all around Paris. All around Paris. The lights came back on. The tourists started flooding in, but they weren't American tourists yet, nor Japanese, nor the Chinese as they're coming now today. The tourists were all Germans, from the lower classes all the way to the higher classes. 
right down there we see uh, kind of a imitation, not imitation, but uh, inspiration from the Arc de Triomphe at La Défense. Oh, I can't wait to show you that to you in person. It's kind of really awesome. And Cheryl, I'll get back to your question later. Um, thank you for asking. Feel free to ask any questions. I'll get back to them in a bit as I show you these views. Hello, Janet. Hello, Pablo. And mind you, as I talk about uh, these battles, even though they might have seemed recent, uh, they were different times. And the people who lived at those times were different people. So if I talk, if I say the story in a light that makes the Germans seem a little bit uh, on, the, on the opposite side, on the bad side, that's why, because I'm framing it within that time, <laughs> that is no longer the case. I <laughs> just, just wanted to uh, disclaim that because I have a lot of German viewers. Of course, I also have Japanese viewers. I have people watching from all around the world. Uh, throughout history, there's always been a back and forth. Uh, and, and we should never hold grudges for too long. So, uh, just, just to let you know. Exactly, Janet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, the, and Germans are still here. Uh, I passed by a stop on the metro called uh, Gare Australitz, I think? Austra? I forgot what, what the exact name was. Uh, however, it, um, it appears to be a very heavy German neighborhood because they had German in the metro stop. While most metro stops speak English, French, sometimes Spanish, uh, but this one was English, French, and German. So right there is Sacre Coeur. It's not going to look so good quality because I'm using my iPhone and this is a night broadcast. So what happened? Why did we get close to this disappearing? Well, as I mentioned, the Germans loved Paris. They were coming here in droves, tens of thousands of tourists, including the military. They were trying to get transferred to Paris in droves as well, including a certain general, General Schortitz. It's hard to pronounce his name. If you're German, please uh, feel free to correct me. But General Dietrich Schortitz, he decided to be transferred right here to Paris because he, along with many of the military members that were stationed here, absolutely fell in love with the city. They started going to the cafes, at least the ones they were welcome to. They started going to the cinemas, watching French films that were thriving at the time. All the signs are starting to be changed into German because they started going to all the major tourist destinations. The artworks, the museums started opening as German museums in Paris. Paris was quickly becoming German. And this wasn't the first time, this was technically the second time the Germans came here. The first time was under Otto von Bismarck when Napoleon III fell. But then things changed for the worse. 1944, August 1944. Adolf Hitler called up General Dietrich Schortitz. Schortitz. He has a funny name, actually. And he said to him, burn Paris to the ground. If any enemy comes here, I want them to only come to rubble. Things were already falling down for him. It's only, it was only until a year later that he would actually fall for good. So Hitler was getting desperate. And Schortitz got that call. However, something happened. He waited. He probably looked at the same view. The Germans owned Paris at that time. They didn't have access to the Eiffel Tower because somehow resistance members cut off the elevator and I think they sawed off part of the stairs to the top of the Eiffel Tower. So they had no access to the Eiffel Tower. Resistance members actually used the Eiffel Tower to scout out where the Germans were. 
Uh, but they had access to the Arc de Triomphe, and he probably looked out somehow at that time or at some point during his um, temporary governorship over here. And the order did not fall through the chain of command. No one, him, somehow just did not follow through. His men did not follow through. Nothing was happening. General Shortsitz waited. Hitler started calling. First, uh, first through his secretaries and all through his uh, other sub-generals and majors and colonels all under his wing started calling the general here. No answer. Somehow he disappeared. More and more calls until Hitler finally called personally. Hello, Casey. Hello, Barrius. Uh, Luce, you will watch this uh, later. Germany is only a couple car uh, car uh, hours away. It is. But how did they end up taking... Let's go a little bit further back. Uh, let's retract a little bit. That's a great question. How did they end up coming here so quickly and without any resistance? I mean, the French army was not so debilitated. <laughs> so, to go back a little bit, why did they come here so quickly? Well, somehow he, I mean, Actually, he, I'm talking about short sets. Uh, let's go back, further back. The French decided to go, send their army to Belgium. And as they were going to Belgium, they decided to go all into Belgium. The reason for that is, is that there's a very impenetrable forest along Alsace-Lorraine. It's called the Black Forest, I think, according to the Germans. Or they have some German name for it. The Black Forest, all down through the border of modern-day France and modern-day Germany. That area has been contested for centuries. However, this was World War II. Technology changed. And the Germans decided not to run their Blitzkrieg through Belgium. The French army were there. However, somehow the Germans found a way to plow their way through the Black Forest and go into France. Once you go through that very dense forest, you're here in Paris within a few hours. And that's how they got here. And that's why Germany is only a mere short few hours away. It wasn't traditionally so. Traditionally, you had to go around the forest into Belgium and into Germany. It was a little bit more difficult. So, Hitler called short tits personally. And he was already upset. He knew he was being ignored. He had a feeling that he was being ignored. And he screamed at him, according to short tits, he screamed at him and said, it's Paris burning very loudly. At that moment, short tits met Hitler a few weeks prior and he knew to himself that, that the man was insane. So what happened then? Well, short tits hung up. The order never went through. Was Paris burning? No. Paris was completely intact. A few short months later, actually a few short weeks later, Short Tits surrenders the city to the Allied troops and the French free army marches through with General de Gaulle down the Champs-Élysées and the Americans as well.
So, is it because of him that we're still able to see the City of Lights tonight with all of you on live video, all 54 of you? And if you're tuning in, share this with your friends and family or on any Facebook groups. Tell them, tag them. Let's get more people into this broadcast. The more people, the better. Was it his orders? Well, that's a little bit controversial. Because this story I just told you was a first-person account of General Shortitz. Sorry, his name is so weird. I just keep saying it and it feels like I'm saying something different. If you're German, please let me know how to say it. <laughs> so, that story I just told you was his personal account. So what really happened? Well, no one knows for sure. Because the only way we can know for sure was that uh, he had orders, but he didn't fulfill them. Why? Or why didn't he do it on time? No one knows for sure. Did he decide to make a story in his memoir to make himself look like the hero? Maybe. It would have been the smart thing to do, actually. However, things get a little bit complicated. Because the French resistance had about 2,000 soldiers and they were really giving the Germans a hard time. They were partly responsible for freeing the city. And that's why the Americans were able to find their way in and help the resistance win. So Paris ain't burning, but the Eiffel Tower is all lit up. Look at that. Again, personal reasons. Yep. I, post I posted this just for family. Uh, thank you for being my family tonight. If you're tuning in right now, just put on the music by Jack Brel or Edith Piaf or, or uh, even Cole Porter's Let's Do It, Let's Fall In Love or Joe Dassin's Champs Elysees. Let me know what's your favorite French song. If you know that tune, let me know in the comments. Wow. Dawn, you say La Ve and Rose, great song. Hello, Loretta. Janet, oh, I absolutely love that song. You will find love in Paris. Great, great song. They look like bubbles in the bottle of champagne frizzing up. Yes, they do, Mari. Uh, I love Brel too. Brel's such a great, great singer. He has one particular song, uh, Ville uh, Thames. I think that's one of my, that is my favorite song ever uh, chansons of French chansons. No Geno de Godian. I do definitely agree with Edith Piaf. I do not regret taking uh, this trip over here and sharing it with all of you. Ooh, here comes the spotlight. Such a great beautiful view says Debbie. Ian says beautiful lights. Gretchen says thanks dad. <laughs> Janet hearts. Uh, Mary uh, thank you for tagging your friend or, or family member. Uh, Dijami. <laughs> I'm not sure what entirely you're saying. I doubt we'll ever see Paris in person, but thank you for bringing it to me. Oh, my pleasure. I'm so glad I can bring you Paris. And Don, don't, uh, I would say, be optimistic because um, it's getting very, very inexpensive to travel to Paris. And I'll put some budget saving uh, tips if anyone wants to learn about it towards the end of my trip when I learned a little bit more how to navigate the city. Thank you so much. <sighs> Beautiful. So, whatever the story was, in short tits, decided to um, 
ignore orders. Well, good. Good, he did. Another more complicated factor was with any of the majors or colonels or any of the officers. Would they have followed orders? Many of them probably wouldn't have not. A lot of the soldiers that asked to be stationed here and end up being stationed here were people who were Francophiles. They were deeply in love with Paris. So there's a good chance they might have not done so. Some of them even decide to stay in Paris and rejected all the pre previous beliefs that they had uh, about Nazism. So regardless, Paris is still standing, luckily. However, let's go downstairs and actually walk through the city lights, see the city of lights in person down the Champs-Élysées and learn about why this arc was built in the very first place. All right, let's take a look down, take a look down. All right, everyone, are you ready to climb some steps? Luckily, we're going downstairs, so it'll be a little bit easier. And someone earlier said, thank you for your sacrifice of uh, uh, live streaming all these. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's my pleasure to share this with all of you on live video. All right, let's go downstairs, get ready for the Champs-Élysées in person. So the arc, the latest you can come in is at 10 p.m. However, I think they let you linger until 11, which is usually the case with uh, high buildings. Even in New York City, same case with like Empire State Building and Top of the Rock. So yeah, I think the latest you can enter is at 10. However, they'll allow you to stay and linger, I think, for an hour. Uh, it's pretty evident. So here is the inside of the arc. There it says Che Monument commenced in 1806. It was built in 18. It was starting construction in 1806. Continued construction in 1823, and was officially finished in 1836. Uh, Gladys, that is no longer the case. You do need a ticket now. You do need to get a ticket. However, the museum pass is valid, and you get to skip the line. Get yourself the museum pass when you come to Paris. I've skipped all the lines so far. It's amazing. Let me show you more. So here they're giving actually an overview of, of the Arc de Triomphe. Amazing. So uh, Louis Philippe decided to continue building the Arc de Triomphe and he decided to honor it back to Napoleon. It was actually in the best interest of the monarchs that took back control to honor Napoleon because Napoleon made himself royalty, despite him not coming from royalty and disturbing the balance of power throughout Europe in order to contend with the people who deeply loved Napoleon, even the people who were upset that he took total control. They were just absolutely charmed by him. He had an incredible charisma, so much so that soldiers um, did anything and everything for him. Here's a uh, un soldat inconocido, I think. Uh, it says incorrigible. I don't know my French too well, but it says uh, soldier inconald. I don't know what that means. La grande guerra homages Venus de mundo entero. So I think uh, this is World War I, a World War I monument. The way I read French is by reading it in Spanish. <laughs> So, why was this built? Well, this was the grand monument to Napoleon I in his own honor because he won a great battle of Austerlitz in modern day Austria. What was Austerlitz? Well, Austerlitz was very pivotal because it was only a year after Napoleon took control of France, total control of France, at the mere age of 30. But being emperor was difficult because he was really good at winning every single battle. Some say he was a military genius, 
Some say he was just extremely lucky. However, Napoleon I was very self-aware of his luck because he was quoted with saying, give me all the lucky generals. Because when, lucky ge when a general is lucky, they know what they're doing. So Napoleon did himself in because he disturbed the balance in power in Europe. The thing is, before the age of Napoleon, just to note, Napoleon was a man from Corsica, not, not noble family, from Corsica, didn't know any French, came over to Brienne and then to Paris, studied uh, the, in the military schools, learned French later on with a very heavy accent, and somehow took total control of Paris, and then later on Rome, Spain, parts of Belgium, etc, etc, etc. That's quite a story. At that time, all of Europe was commanded by nobles, uh, by royalty. Maybe for the exception of, say, the Dutch Republic, everything else was commanded by royalty. And even the Dutch Republic contended with the royalty of other places. And there was this kind of not totally spoken rule of the balance of power. And, uh, <laughs> I love when people photobomb. There's a, this unspoken rule of the balance of power. Because all these royalty of all these different countries from Austria to Spain to Italy to parts of Italy, I mean, to, to Hungary to Germany to Prussia, etc., 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 to England, they were all connected somehow. They were either belonging to the Hasburgs or su such and such family, to the Bourbons. And all of them, because they had these kind of familiar collect, uh, connections, they might have done small battles here and there, right? But they were never going to fully conquer another country. Or they didn't want to fully conquer the continent. Before the age of Bismarck, or before the age of, um, of uh, the the ruler um, during World War I, remind me of his name, and before the age of Hitler, the royal families had this very strict balance of power. If one country got too powerful, the other countries would attack, balance the power again, and all will be well. But Napoleon, not being part of that royal family, not caring about the royalty, ruined that balance of power. And this greatly disturbed all the royal families. The Spanish, the English, the Austrians, the Prussians, and so on and so forth. So they all decided to ally against Napoleon. But what happened? Well, we're going to find out downstairs. Oh, beautiful painting. Angels like flying all around the Arc de Triomphe. Caddy, you say mi papa es historiador, dice que serías un excelente docente universitario. Oh, thank you. Caddy uh, says uh, uh, her father is a historian and he says that I would make an excellent academic docent. Gracias, so agradezco. Me encanta la historia. No soy académico, yo me considero más como un... Un storyteller. No sé cómo se dice eso en español. Una persona que dice historias. Uh, let's go down this way. Where's the exit? Okay. There we go. And it's very Raphael-esque. Yeah, indeed it is. Okay, so we're, let's go downstairs. There's the gift shop, of course. Always have to go to the gift shop. Today we're going to straight to the Champs Elysees. How far am I from Garo du Nord? I actually don't know the distance. Uh, my geography of Paris is not so good yet. Um, however, Paris is small. Paris is about the size of the Bronx in New York City. So, getting from one side to the to one side of the city to the other probably only takes about two hours walking, maybe less. About two hours walking, I think. A little bit, maybe a little bit more. Three hours walking. Oh wow. Look at this. What is this? Mm -hmm. 
fierce warrior with the dragon on his head. Oh, cool artifacts in here. Okay, so if you're coming to Paris, a lot of these monuments are not accessible. So get ready to walk up a lot of stairs. <sighs> I'm gonna show you the perspective. I'm not gonna look down myself, but I'll show you via my camera. <laughs> So, right before, you know, like, what I was talking about before, there's not much to see here, so I'm just gonna point the camera at me. Um, what I was talking about before was, uh, oh, wait, wait a minute, what is this, what is this? Oh, there's another room. It's, it's, stairs are great. I mean, stairs are awesome for getting great cabs. And you know what? Fun fact. If I were a French royalty back in the day, if I belonged to the family Bourbon, I would not want to be belong to the family Hasburg, so. Um, if I belonged to the family Bourbons or the Tudors or whatever, um, because of my great cabs, <laughs> which many of you probably haven't seen, but <laughs> I've been complimented on them before, ironically. Um, calves back in um, in those royal times if you notice a lot of the men always like are slightly raising their foot same thing with women but a lot of men are slightly raising their foot uh, foot and the reason for that is because like men nowadays kind of do like this pose where they're just flexing their biceps they were flexing their calves in order to make it seem bigger because the bigger the calf you had the more attractive you were according to royal society back in the day so that's why in every painting you see the men raising their foot it's very it looks very gently but you see the calves are very strong and usually during the dances that's where the men get to show their strong calves in order to attract <laughs> the beautiful princesses of europe so if i were bourbon hell yeah things would be good but i wouldn't be a hasbert though never never a hasbert so we got a little bit left. <laughs> Get ready, everyone. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> So, back to what I was saying, the reason I was running up these steps as fast as I could is because in Paris, as I mentioned, it's difficult to find fast food. I could go to like McDonald's or Starbucks to find quick food, but you know what? I'm in Paris, I want to enjoy some Parisian food. But it's a catch-22 because I'm doing a bunch of videos and I can't really like take too long eating a good meal. I'll show you the arc soon, but let me finish up this story. Um, I can't turn to, I can't like wait to have a good meal because I just want to optimize the time I get to see Paris and show you it via videos and, and make more videos for supporters via 360 and take photos as well. But after doing two videos and not having any food for like six or seven hours, I decided to sit down at one of the best restaurants here, the Champs Elysees. I just treated myself. Uh, and luckily, then it wasn't too expensive. Um, and I sat down. And in Paris, your food, the service is slow. And it's not slow because they're bad at service. They're slow because they're good at service. For an American, that's kind of shocking. Ooh, whoa! Like, why are they taking an hour to like give me everything or more? Well, 
here to the French, to Parisians and some other similar uh, European countries, they like taking their sweet time to eat. And the dinner usually lasts at least two hours. A coffee could last 45 minutes, or you could stay for hours if you wanted to, even with just a coffee. Once you have a table, the table is yours, and they're not going to rush you out. That's the beauty about Parisian food. I don't know why it just went off, what happened. However, uh, so I decided to get food during this time uh, between my Eiffel Tower broadcast and this broadcast. And <laughs> it took a while. So that's why I was late and had to run up those steps to get to see those beautiful views. So I'm getting great calves for all of you. <laughs> all right, let's talk about the Arc de Triomphe. I don't know why the lights went off, but here we are underneath the Arc de Triomphe. We have names of, I think these might be, they might be battles that they won because these are, all, I see a lot of cities on here like Medellin, Ciudad Rodrigo. Oh, Latin American names. Oh, interesting. We'll talk about this flame over here soon. Let me show you a little bit more of the arc in its surroundings. We're surrounded by the Champs-Élysées. I think it might be around 10, 30 p.m. Paris time, around there, if anyone could let us know. I don't carry a watch and I'm using my phone, so I don't have a uh, time with me. Oh, but look at these beautiful, wow, this is, whew. It's kind of like crazy to look at this in person. Wow. So I've done countless broadcasts at the Washington Square Park Arc, but this is the third largest arc in the world. For, for more than 100 years, it was the largest arc. We're surrounded by, by probably one of the most difficult roundabouts in all of Europe. Here, it's crazy to get around. Look at that. You have to kind of navigate and you connect to all these main boulevards. I think they are eight boulevards, if I'm correct. However, did Napoleon, he commissioned this building, but he never got to step foot inside of it. So what happened to Australis? Well, all the people were gaining up on Napoleon. They were all attacking him in mass. And Napoleon kept crushing everyone in their way. So much so that the Russians even joined the battle and the Russians started marching into France. However, the French obliterated the Austrian army and the Russians panicked. They knew that Napoleon was heading the war. Napoleon wasn't like most other emperors or most other leaders where they kind of lay back at the back at the battle or stay back in the capital city like most kings and queens do. No. Napoleon, the reason he gathered so much respect from the French and the other leaders who were afraid of him was because he marched in front. So Napoleon started chasing the Russians all the way to the city of Austerlitz. And in Austerlitz, he completely encircled all the Russians. He was outmatched and he was outgunned. If we know anything about the Russians, especially uh, the latter history of Napoleon, they have huge numbers. However, the Russians didn't know the area of Austria too well. And the Austerlitz, they were surrounded by the French. And they started retreating once again. However, the only way they could retreat in the dead of winter was through a lake, a frozen lake. So the Russians started going through the frozen lake and Napoleon took his cannons. He looked at the lake. Most leaders would not do this because it's not really conventional to do this. It's rather brutal to do this, especially while an army is retreating. But Napoleon didn't give a F. Napoleon was a man who just gave little 
F's. So he took his cannons, didn't point them at the men, didn't point at the cavalry that was on the other side of the lake. No. Napoleon pointed the cannons directly at the ice of the lake as the Russians were on top of it. Boom! Right on top of the lake, one cannon, boom! Second cannon, boom! Third cannon on the lake, the lake starts cracking and everyone goes down. According to Napoleon, 6,000 men died in an instant. Napoleon recounted later on to one of his secretaries saying, Oh, that was the best day of my life. Now, according to historians, Napoleon may have been exaggerating just a little bit. Might have killed anywhere from 200 to 2,000 men in one instant with that attack. But nonetheless, that attack on the lake scared the Russians and they left, leaving Napoleon victorious and leaving Napoleon the sole ruler of the majority of Europe. The balance of power, how would it ever recover? Well, the British had something up their sleeves. But for that, you have to go all the way back to my London broadcast when I visited Trafalgar Square. Check it out. I'll put the link in the comments afterwards. However, did Napoleon ever cross through here? Let's go and give it a look around and then we'll go to the tomb of the unknown soldier. So this is 300 feet high, the tallest, sorry, 150 feet high, the tallest arc in the world is 220 feet high and that is located in Mexico City, which I'll show you one day when I visit Mexico City. It's crazy history there as well. But when Napoleon passed away, as we talked about yesterday at the tombs of uh, Napoleon Les Invalides, he was at first buried in St. Helena. However, King Louis Philippe asked for his remains back. And he brought him over here. And for his funeral procession, they had a huge procession along the Champs Elysees, bringing the coffin of Napoleon once the Ark was fully completed. So the only time Napoleon was able to ever pass through the Ark was in death. And he was not the only dead person to walk through or to be carried through this Ark, this huge Ark. The other person that was carried through was Victor Hugo, as I mentioned earlier today. So things are already starting to connect throughout this entire city. That's the cool thing once you get to learn more history, you start realizing it's all connected. The other person to walk through, to be carried through this very arc, with two million people in an attendance, completely filling out the Champs-Élysées, was the most famous writer in French history, among the most famous writers in the entire world, Victor Hugo. However, not all men are remembered by name. There's one certain memorial here of an unknown soldier. Why unknown? Well, because in World War I, many French men died, and we don't know their names. And this flame has been burning ever since, for more than 80 years. However, it went away a few years ago. Why? Here is the tomb of the unknown soldier. A flame that was been, has been burning for 80 years up until a few years ago when it went extinguished.
So for this, we have to go back to when, to about 2005. A man, I think he was from Sweden. Swedish man. Damn Swedes. <laughs> I'm just joking. A Swedish man was arrested right here on the site of the tomb of the unknown soldier. You see it's roped off, but there's not big fences around here. So this Swedish man, late at night, I'm not sure what was going through his mind. And for some reason, late at night, he had an egg. Took this egg. Maybe he had more in his bag, I'm not sure. It cracked it right on top of the flame. Trying to cook an egg on top of the tomb of the unknown soldier, this eternal flame. Luckily, the egg burnt off and the flame continued lighting up. But he was arrested quickly. <laughs> so he never got his scrambled eggs or his omelettes off the eternal flame. But then one year later, the World Cup is won by Paris. And people were cheering, having a bunch of fun in the city streets. However, two men from Mexico got very, 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 very drunk. And I'm not sure what was going through their minds, but they came over here to the eternal flame of the unknown soldier, the flame that has been lit for an entire 80 years straight, zipped down their pants and pissed all over it. And the flame was extinguished for the first time since it was lit up. Those men were quickly arrested. <laughs> and for the first time in 80 years, the eternal flame was kaput. Those men probably stayed in jail. In jail. They, they probably enjoyed their, their time there and they were quickly deported along with the Swedish man a year before. So if you want to get deported very quickly from France, that's how you do it. But don't do that. That would be in poor taste. I'm not sure what was going through their minds. Um, I have no idea. Nick, you say uh, sad, Rocky. I'm glad it. I'm glad it wasn't a ugly American that did it. <laughs> Indeed, it was a North American, but it was not American. Um, and he wasn't Mexican American. He was from Mexico. They were from Mexico. So that brings an end to all my stories for this broadcast. We're going to continue walking down the Champs-Élysées. I don't have too much history down there because it's mostly shops. But if you enjoyed my stories, let me know. Press that heart button and let me know if you enjoyed those stories. And if you enjoy my stories and urbanists overall, tell a friend. Tell a friend or a family member. The more people we have on these broadcasts, the more cities I can show you around the world. Not stop at Paris, but we can continue on from New York and then, of course, Rome, Edinburgh, Kilkenny, Dublin, Shanghai, Tokyo, Buenos Aires, etc, etc, etc. So, let me know if you have any other questions and we're going to walk towards the Champs-Élysées. If you want me to point anything out in the Champs-Élysées, let me know. Let me show you the arc just one more time from the front. Hey, Rocky, you had a wonderful time in Paris. Everyone was so nice. Yeah, people are very nice here. Uh, very, very nice here. I've, I've encountered only niceness. Uh, it's not like in America where people smile politely. It's a little bit weird to smile politely here. Uh, people might interpret it uh, negatively. However, aside from that, you'll always encounter people who are very uh, polite and very kind and very talkative if you get... Uh, to know them well. 
and very accommodating and helpful uh, if you ever get lost or anything. So this side of the arc is lit up. They should light up the other side. It's kind of a shame that only one side is lit up. And Denise, you love my stories. Um, and Vivian, you, uh, we love you and your work. Oh, thank you so much, Vivian. I really appreciate it. Wow. It's just crazy seeing this. So, like, this gives me a little bit of, like, kind of sh shakiness. Now, while not, and my hands are shaking, but, like, it feels like wooziness looking at it because there's traffic circling all around me. It feels like this is a street because it used to be a street that you can cross through. And this is so damn high, and it looks like it's top heavy. <laughs> Jenny, you say continues al fin que vos fightis. Ooh, I'm not sure what that means. I think it says something along the lines of continue. Okay, everyone. Uh, we'll come back here after we had a few drinks. Okay, sounds good, right? We'll have a few drinks, maybe a lot of drinks, a few bottles of wine, and then we'll come back here on live video. All right, let's go to the Champs Elysees. We gotta find our way uh, through the bottom because if you're coming to Paris, please, 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 please. I, I really do compel you to not try to cross this street on top of the street, even despite having a lot of drinks. I think even the, the two Mexican men uh, went through the proper way to get to this eternal flame. Uh, so please go through the bottom and, and uh, if you're English they're called the subway I'm not sure what they call it here but the tunnel down below which we're gonna take soon because look at this Avenue it's chaos and we're here at night if you come here during the daytime especially on a weekday and not in August ooh, even more chaos please have patis oh okay yes so yes uh, I'll be doing the broadcast of the history of the croissants go this way I'll be doing a broadcast of the history of the croissants I'll be doing another broadcast on escargot and its history as well at some point uh, next week I'll announce when it probably won't be during the history broadcast times it'll be later in the day but I'll announce when if you want to learn the history of any other French food let me know but on my list is croissants and baguettes I'll probably do it at the same time. And then I'll also be doing, um, uh, as I mentioned, escargot, which is snails. But it has a crazy history. I think all of you are going to enjoy it. Okay, I'm not sure how much service I'm going to have here, so I'm going to try to walk here as fast as possible. So bear with me. So this is the tunnel that goes underneath the crazy roundabout of the uh, uh, Arc de Triomphe along the Champs Elysees. Debbie, you would like to learn a little bit about French wine? Sure. I'll combine that with my escargot uh, story because um, it almost, it's only fitting to get some wine with some escargot. And also, if you enjoy these videos, become a supporter right down there. You get access to 360 videos and map guides every so often. And also, think of it as a tip for all these videos, like give me a coffee on a monthly basis, buy me a coffee on a monthly basis. It'll be greatly appreciated and it'll help continue and grow uh, Urbanist. As I mentioned, I still have intentions of bringing Urbanist beyond just me. I want to bring more people along for here and keep growing it and making bigger documentaries. So all your support is greatly appreciated. And here we have arrived to the Champs d'Elysée, named after the Elysian fields, the underworld for the heroes of Greek mythology. 
why did they call it that? Well, this was uh, sh around the... What's the name? Around the Hello. French Revolution. And in the French Revolution, they end up calling this the Champs-Élysées because they want to honor the dead heroes of the revolution. Before then, it was called the Grand Corps. Uh, na named after, like, basically the Grand Courtyard, the, the Grand uh, Plaza. And it used to be just a field filled with a bunch of cows uh, during the 1700s. Until George Hugen Houseman's grand plan completely uprooted the entire city, built all of these grand boulevards, and decided to make the Arc de Triomphe the centerpiece. If you're taking a selfie, this is a great place for a selfie. I took one earlier. Hi from Pakistan. Hello Najib. I'm so happy you were able to tune in again. I know you've been tuning in, I think literally since my first broadcast. We have a few other people who've been tuning in since my first ever Urbanist video, like Kay and Cindy. We have a few others. So let me get to your questions. You had some wonderful food in Paris. Uh, indeed, that's all awesome to hear. I heard today that customer... <laughs> oh no, because he didn't make his sandwich quick enough. Uh, yeah, it happens. I don't discuss news, but yeah, that, that sucks. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I'm laughing. Um, it's just uh, it just sounds so deeply absurd. It sounds almost like it comes from a British comedy um, skit. But yeah, that's that's very sad to hear that that happened. I, uh, sorry for my laughter. Najib, I'm so happy. Paris is your dream. I hope to actually go to Karachi one day. Karachi would be amazing. It's a very different city from Paris, of course, but. Um, I know there's a lot of history there as well, and apparently great food. Uh, then you saw inside, the head you saw inside is a duplicate of the monumental sculpture of the face of the Ark by Francis Rood. La Marseillaise? Ooh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, but... Oh, thank you so much for the extra information, George. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, please keep doing what you're doing, says Janet. Oh, definitely will. Thank you for translating. Take some time for yourself. Enjoy Paris. Can't stop smiling at people even though I know it's weird. Yeah, I can't either. I, I just do it automatically as an American. Uh, I just got way too used to it. Um, yeah, I just, I just cannot bear not smiling at people. So I, I feel you. And don't, don't feel bad if you do it here. Uh, people might look at you weird, but hey, be yourself. You know, I think that's that's part of the cool thing about traveling is, yeah, you can learn how to fit in, which is awesome, and you can do many cool things to fit in. Like in Paris, take your time with food, but there's also something magical about just kind of continuing to be yourself. I not at, at not the cost of anyone else, of course, but if you just be yourself, I think uh, it helps the world just come a little bit closer. So here we have a cinema. Now, the Champs-Élysées is known for two things. Well, three things, actually. But I would say, yeah, three things. The cinema, the shops, very, very expensive shops, and the food, very, very expensive food. And hello, Nur. Um, I'll try to find a patisse here if I can, a quick one. And we love your stories. Oh, thank you. If you can't afford a, a, a plane home, go back to the Turtle Flame. <laughs> I'll consider that. <laughs> and go ahead and laugh. I learned that the French national anthem in my French cast is the only thing I really remember in French, says Dora. Oh, yeah. And sorry, I ignore your question earlier, Cindy. Let me get to it. See if I can find it. I stay at the Elise Ceramic Hotel back in May. Oh, amazing. And Cheryl, oh, it was Cheryl. Cheryl, you say, are you going to do a private dining experience at someone's home? You know what? I've, I've always wanted to do that, Cheryl. And I hope you're still watching. 
Uh, if you are, let me know. Uh, I'll answer it via text. But Cheryl asked if I would ever do a, a live video at someone's home of a private dining experience. I would. I just don't know anyone personally here in Paris. I know one friend, but I don't think she's a cook. Um, yeah, but if I ever meet someone that is a cook or, or loves food somehow and doesn't mind being on camera, I would really consider it. I think it would be super cool. I've been wanting to do it. Um, so I'll actually put that out in the universe. I would love to do a live video at someone's home and kind of get a very intimate Facebook Live of eating at someone's home and enjoying uh, the food that they make uh, of their own culture. So if not in Paris, maybe some other city. Who knows? Let me know if, if you are a cook and would love to be on the Facebook Live with me and live in the major city, let me know. Let me know in the comments. Uh, I think it would be something awesome. And I should have sent you more, I should have sent you more uh, information on the relief. George, thank you so much for sending information just in general. Um, everyone give hearts to George, Donald, Kay, and a few other people who are constantly updating on Urbanists of the World Facebook group and posting awesome photos. Check it out on the Facebook group. Cinemas. Cinemas are very important for the Champs-Élysées because, as I mentioned, during World War II, French cinema started taking off. But during World War II, French cinema was copying a lot from American cinema. Because the French really didn't allow American cinema to really take hold here and people wanted to see movies in their own language, the French either bootlegged American classics, got dub, official dub versions of American classics, or they just remade them outright. Sometimes with or without permission. Many countries did that around the world. Copyright, uh, international copyright was just beginning to take hold. It wasn't really that strict yet, or that uh, formalized yet. So in World War II, the Champs-Élysées was filled with cinemas. However, that changed even more so in the 1950s and 60s. After World War II, the French really took hold of their cinema. And by the 1960s, the French completely separate ties from anything American and fully made their own form of cinema in French New Wave. With that, brought a whole lot of new stars into French cinema that started becoming world famous, even in America, inspiring directors like Martin Scorsese or Darren Aronofsky, one of my favorite directors as well. Many, many others, or, or George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. May not Steven Spielberg, actually. But George Lucas, yes, and, and, um, and Francis Ford Coppola as well. These stars were like Francis Truffaut, Catherine Deneuve, uh, Jean-Luc Godard, etc, etc. So many different French filmmakers started coming out. And they had all their major premieres right out here in all the cinemas along the Champs-Élysées. So at any moment you would see the biggest stars not just in French cinema, but also in French music. Because the French musicians would also come to these big premieres. Musicians like Jack Brel, who is Belgian, I know, but he lived in Paris. Uh, or Francois Hardy, also another great Parisian singer, I love her. Uh, so many, many others started uh, coming here. So you can just imagine coming here in the 1960s, seeing uh, Francois Truffaut with Francois Hardy, uh, going into one of the major cinemas, enjoying uh, French New Wave and Cinema Verite, all these art forms that heavily influenced not just some of the greatest American directors, but also influenced YouTube. Go watch any the Casey Neistat vlog and you'll see a direct influence of French New Wave and even YouTube videos. And I'm influenced by Casey Neistat. So that means I have an indirect influence from French New Wave as well. So thank you, Fresh New Wave. <laughs> yes, cooking and eating at someone's home would be amazing. It would be. Must visit Karachi and Islamabad. Uh, they are own their beauty and history. Yes, indeed. As I mentioned, it's a long-term project. Catherine Deneuve lives in San Supiche. Ooh, whoa. Catherine Deneuve is still alive? Oh, I didn't know that. That's so cool. That's amazing. I, I, I did not know she was still alive. 
Um, I think Odard passed away just a few years ago. I think Truffaut also passed away a few years ago. Let me know if you know of any other famous French stars. Um, those are the ones that come into my head, but let me know if you know any others. The second thing most famous here are the restaurants. And the restaurants here are famous. Some of them are very high class and they're kind of in, in uh, more of the interior of the buildings. But the ones that are outside are famous because you get to sit and watch all these tourists, high class people, and sometimes even stars walk past by. Stars, not just French stars, but stars from all around the world come along the Champs Elysees. Maybe for shopping, maybe for sightseeing, maybe for going into the restaurants themselves and grabbing a $10 coffee to sit down and watch the views. Or maybe going to McDonald's. Oh, never mind. <laughs> you could get, you, so you might not need to spend a $10 coffee. You could get a, a $2, 2 euro burger. Uh oh. Had to run away. There is a Justin Bieber song. No offense to Justin Bieber, because it's that there is copyright. Hopefully Facebook did not hear that. Hopefully I spoke loud enough. Facebook, please don't mute this video. Please don't delete it. Oh my God. <laughs> that rarely happens. Crossing fingers. <laughs> Hello, Kiara. Welcome. Nice to see you here. Kay will make me some red velvet cupcakes. Well, Kay, I really appreciate the red velvet cupcakes and I will definitely have them, but you do have to make me something Irish as well. An Irish treat, if you know any others. Hang out at Tabac. <laughs> a live video from a Tabac. Smoking a good French cigarette <laughs> like they used to do in the 1960s. I went to my fave tabak and the guy invited me to eat at his apartment. Oh, that's a wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I imagine that happens. I have encountered that too much personally, but I know a lot of people do. Um, which is great to hear. Uh, Denise, you know someone in Paris? He's Colombian photographer and they do stuff like here. Can you hook you up? Yeah, I would love that. Please uh, introduce me if uh, they know a lot about Paris. I would love to meet Parisians. So here are the cafes. Eighth arrondissement. Yeah, it's 1.9 kilometers long uh, till the Place de Concorde. We're probably gonna just walk until Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, Road. Yep, there's a road called Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And if you know why, let me know in the comments. Hint, I mentioned part of that story, top of the arc. Hello, Edward. Welcome. Hello, Leanne from Australia. <laughs> Kay would make me some Irish stew and cabbage. Ooh, Kay, I would really appreciate that. Yes. Uh, I will take you up on that offer and live stream that dinner. So everyone, stay tuned. One day uh, when I'll go to Kilkenny in Ireland, combined with uh, Dublin and most likely Edinburgh as well. You'll be seeing me doing a live video with Kay. If you want to see that, press those heart buttons, learn a little bit about Irish food in the near future. So here, there's a, there's a movie premiere. So here's Lido de Paris. I think this might be one of the older cinemas. They play a few movies, including a movie that stars um, the man who played the Nazi soldier in the film Inglorious Bastards, who was a Nazi war hero who was shot to death. Oh, that's so cool. I, I forgot his name. Oh, no, no, that's... Oh, sorry, my mistake. He looks very similar to him. That's Emil Hirsch. That's a different actor. My mistake. Looks very similar to him. But if you want to watch a great film about, like, Paris in World War II, that's kind of fantastical in a good way. It makes you feel kind of good if you are... Um, if you are uh, either French or American or English, watch Glorious Bastards. Great, great film by Quentin Tarantino, at least in my opinion. And here there happens to be a movie premiere. That's so cool. And people are very well dressed for 
I don't think it's might not be a big premiere, it might be a regular movie, but people are really well dressed for it. And people are taking photos in front of it as well. So people are just taking photos in front. Hi Irene, I'm so happy you were able to tune in. Crazy to think of, of it. It was 1987, 32 years ago that you came here, Rocket. If you came here before, let me know how was it? Is there any difference between the Champs Elysees and now? It's so cool. This is a gorgeous theater. Let me zoom in a little bit on that. Oh, wow, look at that gold, shiny gold. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, I wonder what theater they. Um... Oh, this is. Uh, I think this is a dinner and show theater. That's why. So it does not premiere. My mistake. This is a dinner and show. Seems like a very uh, popular attraction. People dress up for it. Here are the apartments of the Champs Elysees. So, if you want to know why Paris is the city of lights, actually, I'll tell you because it was I did it on the streaming of the Magic page, not here on Urbanist. So why is the Paris the city of lights? Well, I talked a little bit about before and the other broadcasts, but if you haven't watched them, back in the 1600s, one of the French kings uh, sent an ordinance to all the bourgeois of Paris to lit up, light up candles in front of their homes. So many of the bourgeois, some of the bourgeois complied, and they put up candles in front of their homes. A lot of them didn't comply. But the thing is, the ones even the ones that complied, if it rained just a little bit or there was a little bit of wind, the candles would blow out. So that didn't work. Zoom a little bit more than 150 years later, in the late 1700s, and Paris does something really radical. Actually, a little bit later, in the mid 1500s, right around George Eugene Hausmann's rechanging of the entire city. They put an ordinance to put gas light lamps all around Paris at that time. More than 1,100 gas light lamps in main Paris. That's a whole lot of lamps. Now for perspective, New York City also had lamps, but it was only in a tiny little neighborhood called the Gaslight District and a few spattering of other ones in other places. This was throughout the entire city and they were all lit up by tilapia oil. Tilapia is a bottom feeder fish that you that is very popular in French restaurants you also find them in American restaurants as well uh, the fish is everywhere because it's very easy to grow and eat um, and they make it with tilapia oil in New York City for example they use whale oil and many other parts they use oil, different types of oil and that was initially why Paris was called the city of lights but then with George Eugene Hausmann he made it even more full, formal and he put specific uniform height restrictions on all the lights. One height restriction being 6 meters for pedestrian lights, like this one right up here, and 9 meters for traffic lights. Every single light the same. But then electricity came into shape in the 1880s. And I've noticed this before, because who invented electricity? Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was known as the wizard at Menlo Park. Who innovated electricity? Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse, who, he, who hired Nikola Tesla. But why isn't New York the city of lights? I've noticed this before. New York seems like the city of lights. I mean, that's where electricity was born. It was the first major electrical plants and the first lit up streets were in New York. But why does Paris have that title? Well, it's because of that infrastructure. That infrastructure that was inputted by the gas lamps of yours, Eugene Hausmann. And when electricity came, the, pa uh, the Parisians jumped on it. And they converted all these gas lamps into electricity. Suddenly, Paris was way more lit up than even New York. Definitely way more lit up than London. Way more lit up than any other city in the world. Gaining the nickname, the City of Lights. That was even further solidified by the Exposition Universal, with the Eiffel Tower also being lit up by electric light bulbs 
and many of the other monuments also being lit up, including the Paris Opera, which I'll talk about probably next week. Stay tuned. So that's why New York, unfortunately, breaks my heart. It's not the official city of lights, though it kind of is. But Paris is officially the city of lights. FDR, ally of the France during World War II. Yes, you're right. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president during, uh, for the Americans during World War II. And the Americans uh, were the ones who finally broke through, uh, got help from the French resistance fighters and General Charles de Gaulle. And ended up liberating the city with Charles de Gaulle and marching right down here. I don't think FDR was here for that. Uh, however, the Americans were represented with the army leading down. And I think there was a major gen uh, uh, general here as well. And George, you say when uh, you were here in 1984, you found the French incredibly classy and dressed well. When you went back in 2002, it was a huge disappointment. American crappy clothes. <laughs> The French are so awesome with photobombing. Uh, the photobombing French style is so unique. Uh, I love it. It's like um, not as invasive as sometimes New Yorkers can be. And not as scared away as Spani the Spaniards were. They really didn't like cameras over there. Uh, American crappy clothes took over and graffiti. Yeah, you're right. And Yamina, hello. And... Rocky, it looks nice tonight. 1987, you had a great um, time. I'm afraid I'll be disappointed coming back. Yeah, come in with different expectations. Uh, Champs Elysees is, I mean, there's a lot of very expensive shops all around, but you have to be ready. This is uh, not the glamorous Champs Elysees that you might remember uh, from a few decades ago. What do apartments go for over here? I have no idea off the top of my head, but I would only assume millions of euros. Um, however, personally, I, I would not want to live here because it would be very, 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 very loud. So this is the restaurant that I visited earlier. Now in modern times, the city, uh, now in modern times, the city of lights not lights related to the knowledge and ideas that Paris became. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you can, you can discern a uh, double meaning from the City of Lights. I read a couple of books that Paris during World War II like those. Uh, it made me uh, try to uh, find more any recommendations. Interesting. So here is Fouquet's. One of the top rated restaurants here in the Champs-Élysées. Very fancy. Very beautiful inside very expensive I would say it's worth it you do not you're not required to buy yourself a very expensive entree which run around 30 euro average uh, there is a three course meal for 86 euro euro actually let's cro let's try crossing the street I'll show you up close and then we'll kind of zigzag around um, 86 euro for a three course meal which is not so bad you're in the Champs-Elysees uh, one of the most um, famous boulevards in the entire world. But it was absolutely gorgeous and it was by far the best service I ever had. And I actually then managed to spend too much. I just got myself a croque monsieur and a coffee with a bunch of desserts and then gave me an extra coffee. I don't know why. Maybe the waiter was feeling good. And it only cost me about 34 euro with service added. So it was very inexpensive, but uh, this is one of the most famous restaurants. We'll, we'll, cross, restaurants. we'll, we'll cross the street soon. You can, um, many of the famous French stars, as I mentioned earlier, at some point had dinner at Fouquet's. So Truffaut, Godard. Maybe Godard didn't... He probably didn't like too much fancy food. Uh, but Truffaut definitely did. If you know any other... Well, I am not going to have pastries here, but if I find another pastry shop, I will uh, grab one while we're walking down. Maybe Hermes is still open. We'll check it out. 
but maybe later in the night no actually it doesn't seem you need reservations uh, maybe on the Friday night but you can just walk in and it's actually it's gorgeous inside just absolutely beautiful it's one of the few restaurants where they have kind of this railing around it so it's very calming if you um, are here as a solo traveler with baggage like I am I'm carrying you know my um, my camera my gimbal you know I don't I sometimes hesitate in um, going to the cafes and sitting right by the streets because I don't I do I maybe want to go to the bathroom and don't want to leave my baggage unattended um, but here they have it closed off which is amazing so if I were to recommend it don't go here for a full meal but go here for a coffee it won't be a big issue in every single French cafe it's okay to just grab yourself a coffee even though they have very uh, expensive dishes but yeah 11 p.m. is very busy so Fouquet's I would recommend it you won't find the top quality the best food ever but it is very good food for its price um, and uh, it's worth it just for the scenery and for being on the Champs-Elysees and you can potentially be on the Champs-Elysees sitting in amazing relaxed seats with great service for only about 10 euro for a coffee and if you get the coffee with desserts it's only 18 euro Sorry, I didn't know what what is patisse. I don't know what patisse is. Sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you were saying pastry. I don't know my French. Part of my French, I really don't know many French words. So, uh, patisse has pinard retard, retard uh, which is the absinthe. Is it a cocktail? Let me know, uh, Gretchen. And I had to ask Alexa. A uh, euro is one eleven U.S. exchange. Yes, right now, the best exchange rate for the euro to U.S. is right now, ever. Uh, so I recommend if you're coming to Europe, do it soon. Uh, the exchange rate is excellent. However, I tend to follow the advice of uh, one, I think, one of the best people who makes travel content. I make content about history, uh, but when it comes to travel, if you see anyone, by far you have to go and check out Rick Steves Europe. Uh, Rick Steves is an American travel guide and he has his books Rick Steves guides which are great and also he has uh, many videos and documentaries of all the cities also talks about each city etc etc it's really awesome and he says that in the hey how's it going yes. <laughs> viva la France no no it's okay thank you <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> um, so, he offered me a ride, which is interesting. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so adventurous. I would need to meet the person personally um, to ask for a ride from a random person. He had a nice car, though. I have no idea why he was offering me a ride. I have encountered that in French society. I know that happens in other places in Europe. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> back to the story. That, that was awesome. Um, if I were a little bit more adventurous, I might have gone. Uh, would you have gone to the car? I know for women, women it might be very um, precarious. Uh, if I were a woman, I, probably, I would definitely would not. But if, 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 if you were a man, would you have randomly gone to the car of a man in a BMW saying, come inside? <laughs> I don't know. He wanted to get, it sounds like it. I mean, it is very weird. <laughs> it, like, it's not really in the French style to do that. You might encounter that in some other countries, but it's not really in the French style to do that. It's not in the style of many countries. There's very few countries where uh, people could be that hospitable. <laughs> this is why I love going on live video. Um, Again, no, says Denise. No freaking way. I'm glad everyone agrees with me. Patisse is an alcoholic drink with, made with anise. Oh, cool. Okay. See if you can find some absinthe. The impressionist loved it and has mind-tripping effects. Uh, you uh, probably won't encounter the mind-tripping effects. However, you won't encounter here in Paris, in France, because uh, French absinthe 
has very, very little wormwood, which is the ingredient that makes that mind tripping effect. However, it comes in such low quantities that generally it's very exaggerated for absinthe and doesn't actually give you that huge mind tripping effect. Here's lottery, which I did a history of the ma uh, macaron before. Check it out. I didn't do it at this exact store. I did the one at Plaza de Concorde, but check it out. This is their most famous store and restaurant. And they have outdoor seating as well. So back to my story. I'll read your comments soon. Rick Steve says he has great, uh, great um, recommendation. If you're coming to, if you're traveling, you have to allow yourself to treat yourself at least once. And you can treat yourself in a variety of ways. You can treat yourself in maybe treating yourself via. Sorry, I'm, there's a lot of stuff going on. Treat yourself via grabbing a good food. Like going to a very fancy restaurant, set aside 100 euro, treat yourself to the top quality restaurant. In, in the greater scheme of things, for most people, 100 euro is not that big of an expenditure. Um, or you can set your scythe and treat yourself grabbing yourself a $10 coffee or a $20 cocktail, but to sit in the most famous avenue ever. And this can apply anywhere around the world, but I think Champs-Élysées is probably a, on the top of that list. And in retrospect, I don't regret spending those 34 euro to sit down and people watch in the Champs-Élysées. It was a great two hours. Uh, yeah, I got a 24 euro croque monsieur and a $10 coffee, but I enjoyed the heck of it. So yeah, I think, uh, take that, I, I, I encourage you to consider that whenever you're traveling. You don't have to do every day, because it might get very expensive. It might be also useless, uh, but do it at least once. You know, spend that 10 euro for a coffee, or 20 euro for one cocktail. Sit down, enjoy the Champs-Élysées. These restaurants are not gonna rush you, you stay here two or three hours and people watch in the most famous boulevard of all yeah and you can do that in many other famous places if you know any other places that are similar to that i wouldn't say times square maybe times square maybe the 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 um the hotel rooftop bars uh, you only spend about 20 dollars on the cocktail there um, so yeah let me let me know what you think See if you can find some absinthe. Rex Steves is awesome, but you are better. I appreciate that compliment. Um, I, Rick Steves is, is, is truly amazing. I really appreciate what he does. He has helped me so much in getting to know a city uh, before I even come here. So, unlike Rick Steves, he comes to a city, figures it out, or he has a team of people that figure out a city, all the best spots. When he, when he started doing it alone, he, he personally came to the city, was a tour guide for Americans coming to Europe, and got to learn the city and, and end up uh, teaching it to other people. Uh, however, for me, I don't have that luxury because I'm from New York City, so I know New York City off the top of my, ha off the top of my head, on the back of my hand. Um, but coming to Paris, I don't know off the back of my hand, but I still want to give you great content um, with, my, with the way I tell stories because I love telling stories. So... I had to find a way to quickly acquaint myself with the city without being there first. Because uh, I just, I just don't, do, don't want to take the time to spend a, a month here and then later do videos. So I'm so grateful for Rick Steves on uh, making great content. And making great content allowing me to acquaint myself quickly to the city so I can come to Paris and give you this experience of history. So heart buttons for Rick Steves. Rocky say he has great shows. A lot of people say no, you would not go. Bizarre, not good idea for a woman or men. Woman or men. And I'm not sure, but there's 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 very very iffy characters here in the Champs Elysees. In Europe, you'll never encounter in in France specifically. Sorry, not entire Europe, but in France, you won't really encounter violent crime. But 
uh, as we were passing through, I did see a few like men like looking around and whispering to each other. Uh, definitely very shady characters. I don't know why. If anyone knows why, let me know. But uh, I'm not getting like a bad vibe, but um, there's people here that I'm getting like a strange vibe, a weird vibe. If anyone's from Paris have been here, let me know. What's up? What's up with this? So Gretchen, you say the new Absinthe doesn't do that anymore. So Absinthe does have that effect, but not here in Paris. Now, this is only a first person account, and my two friends can attest to this, but when I went to Prague and had a very strong Absinthe drink in Prague, where they use a different recipe, they use more of the classic recipe, and there's not so much heavy regulation with Absinthe, uh, I got a very different, different drunk feeling. I, of course, did not feel any hallucinations or anything. I think those are mostly exaggerations. I know what uh, I've done before uh, uh, hallucinogenic substances, just so you know. And I do know the difference. I don't think it was that. Um, but what I did feel was like a weird, different drunk. Hey, how's it going? What I did feel was a weird, different drunk that was very wavy and very... Uh, uh, kind of interesting, such different uh, alcohol I've ever tried in my life. Before you leave in Paris, you must have a uh, bouffe, a bourgeon, ooh, interesting, what is that? Yeah, Najib, yeah, that's why I mentioned that some countries are different in terms of hospitality. Here's uh, Five Guys, <laughs> very American, from Chicago, Obama's favorite burger here in Paris. So yeah, that's why I mentioned that some, some countries are different where some people do offer you rides out of nowhere and those countries are like countries like Pakistan, I heard uh, Iran is like that. Uh, many, many places around the Middle East and, and uh, in India, I've heard, are very similar to that. Here's a beautiful restaurant, wow. Here's called La uh, Sauce, which we'll learn why there's a lot of sauce here all around Paris. You could get a patis for seven euro and 99% of the time a reason a ride is not is offer is not for uh, kindness and Rocky says you're brilliant at telling uh, telling stories and Donna says you're good good you're very observant and they see your cameras. I mean so interesting um no, people sometimes like, um, I know what you mean, um, however Persian culture I've uh, seen that people don't really mind cameras. Sorry I'm not talking too much about the Champs-Elysees, if you want me to show anything please let me know. The restaurant now, the, the restaurant now is br uh, brilliant, sauce, not too expensive. And that's so strange, American restaurants in Paris. And tender, tender beef is so good. Ooh, amazing, la sauce is affordable. And Helen says, always follow your gut. Oh yeah, always follow my gut. So I only have 10% battery left, uh-oh. So we're almost done. Always follow your gut, that's right. I do the same, I always follow my gut, my intuition. Um, and remember, if anyone tries to cheat you or rob you, it's not because they have something against you personally, at least generally. I know some circumstances might, sometimes might be different, but generally, it's nothing because they have nothing personal against you. It's because they're just being smart and they know to pick an American or a Latin American or whoever else uh, that seems more easier to pick their pockets or, or cheat them out of something. So don't take it personally, just say no, keep your distance, and keep on going. And there we go. So here is a little bit more of, also, of um, Champs-Elysees and another big cinema, another big cinema. So Nick, I also had a very big fear of pickpockets, however, I have really, I've, I've kept 
my wallet inside my bag, deep inside my bag, uh, where it's not vulnerable, where people can just like put their hand in it. Uh, luckily, my my bag, I'll recommend it later, has a nice um, magnetic strip to it, so I can uh, secure it on a chair or on a piece of furniture if I'm staying in the place, or I can secure it around my leg as well if I'm in the train. And with that, I have found I felt a whole lot easier and a lot lighter. Now, so I connect my phone to a power bank, which is in my bag, and sometimes that helps to secure it, secure it a little bit better. So we have reached the end. We have reached Franklin Delano Roosevelt Way. Thank you, everyone, so much for tuning in. What is the Chomps restaurant? Denise says, go with your gut feelings. And thank you everyone so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, let me know. Press that heart button. Sorry for talking a little things a little bit more negative. I hope it didn't uh, put the vibe down. Ooh, a hookah bar. I love that. That's so cool. That's so awesome. I lo if you don't know me too well, I know I love hookah. Um, hookah is the water pipe tobacco. Sometimes they use tobacco. Sometimes they don't use tobacco, which kind of sucks. But really, really fun experience. <laughs> I'll talk about it one day uh, when I visit the Middle East or Morocco or something like that. Or Turkey as well. If you enjoyed this, let me know. If you want to see more cities around the world, become a supporter right down there. Think of it as giving me a tip, as buying me a coffee on a monthly basis. Um, that helps That helps to contribute to make Urbanist Thrive, uh, bring us to more cities all together. Right now we have 40 people all traveling from the comfort of their own phone to places all around the world. I continue uh, putting these videos for free because I believe history should be available to everyone. And in order to, for me to keep doing so, I love anyone who can lend their support. And if you want support in other ways, tell your friends and family about this. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in. I might do an extra broadcast of Patis at La Sauce because a lot of people said it was good. So maybe tune in for that. I'll see. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. From the Champs d'Elysee. Ba, ba, da, da, da. Da, 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 da. Listen to Joe Dassin's Champs d'Elysee. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Every day, 9 a.m. New York City time, 3 p.m. Paris time. Till the 25th of August. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Thanks, exploring. Bye bye, everyone. See you, party.